This conference will now be recorded. There's your warning. <laughs> okay, we're going to start by looking at the uh, meeting summary and see if there are any additions or changes anybody would like to make. I'd like to make one. Uh, I believe that's when Natalie was first introduced was during that that meeting, and so uh, we should we should add that to the uh, minutes of the meeting. I think it was towards the beginning, but. You know, if, if we can just have uh, uh, Matthew or Ron, can you make that change? I will do that. Great. Terrific. <clears throat> and welcome aboard once again, Natalie. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, the one thing I, I want to do is uh, there's been a fair amount going on with uh, that presentation that I gave at the last meeting. And I want to uh, just give a quick update of that and show you a few additional slides that, you know, as I said before, it's a straw man and I've tried to flesh it out uh, just a little more. So if I may. Here, I'm going to get this one in. So do I have to take over the. Uh, oh, there's Lee. That is right. <laughs> Yeah, you you should be able you should be able to do that, Rhett. Okay, now what do I do to do that? Uh, there is uh, up on the I left the there's a, down at down at the bottom. There's screen. If you click on screen, I'm clicking on it, and uh -huh. it doesn't seem to be available to me to take over. This, this let one. me let me fix that, Rhett. Okay. There you go. Perfect. Okay. So uh, now, do I have the screen? You should be able to. You have been made the presenter. Oh boy. Okay. The thing that I want to get on the screen is where'd it go? Here and here. Can people see this now? Is the slide of Not vaccinations? Yet. It seems like right now that all I'm seeing are all the faces and things. Oh, screen, let me try that again. Huh. There's the share screen. It would appear that I should be able to do that, but it's not. Take it a little eager to do that. You everyone who's talking at cameras. So at the at the bottom right. Yeah, uh, I see. I see screen. screen. If you click yeah, on screen, click on that, and uh -huh. that should let me share this my screen, right? Right. Oh, and you can either a, click. Here we go. Yeah. There's another one over here on the other side. Yep. Okay. All right, we see your screen. Do you see my screen? Do you see the process concepts for mass vaccinations? Yes. Good. That's all I want to all I want to bring up. You don't need to know everything that I'm doing in my life. <laughs> okay. So, um the as I said before the last time I presented it was a straw man. There were a few other things I wanted to add to to the regular proposal. Um right. And and it, it's sort of pardon right th but this is doug um we can see your calendar just fyi oh <laughs> okay well let's and the slide is quite this. tiny we don't need that but we probably need more of this yeah yeah if you can maximize that that'd be great yeah i'm on it how's that Can you now see it better? Doug? Yep, it's better. Okay. Uh, so, so there are just a few things I wanted to add to it. This, this is about the process of doing mass vaccinations and how you can move more people through lines and things like that. I don't want to go into the details of any of these things uh, very much because we really got a lot to cover today. And uh, I think the some of the especially towards the end when we're talking about uh the uh 
strategic priorities, that's going to be the most critical thing we do today, I, I suspect. So I added that slide. I also added this slide on what a COVID VAX card might look like and why we want to create those. The, the key thing here is if, if we want, for example, an employer to be able to verify that someone has been vaccinated before they hire them into their job, especially those jobs that have a lot of uh, contact with other people, a lot of employers are going to say, hey, I want you to be vaccinated if you're going to you know, be a server in my restaurant or, or whatever else. So with this QR code, they could basically take a smartphone, you know, image that QR code with their uh, with their photo and then jump into something that shows the picture of the person in the verification that they've been vaccinated. And so that is a, a powerful tool to have for lots of reasons. It's also something we could use uh, to basically say, all right, these rail cars are just for people who have been vaccinated, which would let us get the volume that we can carry up rather ra rapidly. And also, you could also do it with buses or you could do it with sections of buses on rail cars. And so it's another incentive for the people who are, uh, who are getting vaccinated. So um, some people are really uh, very concerned about privacy. And this is an idea for uh, essentially a, a simplified card. And in this case, uh, they don't have to provide all their contact information, just a, an email or a phone number. Uh, this is especially important. Remember, this is not going to work unless we get all residents, whether they're, you know, whether they're uh, uh, people who are necessarily an undocumented residents who maybe shouldn't be here, but they are here and they're often in jobs in contact with a lot of other people. If we really want to get rid of this, this virus, we've got to get to them as well. And we have to get to people that are naturally suspicious of government and vaccination programs in particular. And that includes you know, African-Americans who have a long history uh, going back uh, to times when uh, the Tuskegee experiments were going on, things like that. And then, uh, so finally, I, I wanted to say that time is really of the essence in this. And if we look at what the next steps are, uh, Dr. Cox already reached out to RTD staff, Bill Van Meter and Mike Meter. And, uh, and so they're looking at next steps. Uh, this, is, this is a straw man, it still needs to be fleshed out more. Uh, but I've also had a couple of discussions or more than a couple with some RTD board members who are interested and there seems to be support there but it really has to be owned by rtd rtd has to say all right these are the things we like we're, we're concerned about these parts i'd like the opportunity to reach out work with rtd some on that uh, as well and i just want to make sure that no one on the committee has any concerns about about me doing that so that's basically all I wanted to say, and I, I want to hear from the committee members if anybody is concerned about uh, moving forward some more with this now. Raise your hand if, if you're not concerned. How about that? I'm not concerned about it. Anybody else? Rebecca or? Okay, I'm going to assume that, that I can move ahead with this. Hey, hey, Red, I do have a question, though. It, as you've been doing a lot of research on this, what what timing are you assuming in, in your thinking of how this could help RTD for when the vaccine would be available? You know, I think there's probably going to be a few doses of vaccines uh, available right at the beginning of the year, uh, beginning of next year. I should say which year, I guess. <laughs> But there's, there's a lot going on with the vaccines. Uh, two of the prominent ones are actually, their trials are shut down right now because they've had uh, a, one case in one and two cases in the other where they think there may be some adverse reactions. And uh, the uh, of the other two, they have said that they're planning on, by the end of the year, having several million uh, uh, samples of the or um, doses. But there's a process that you have to go through. You can get an emergency authorization for a limited amount for a period of time, but uh, we also don't want to get ourselves in a situation where we grab a vaccine 
and start working with that vaccine and it's not ready for prime time. So my guess is, the short version is, I think there'll probably be some at the very beginning of the year. I think we'll have to look at what uh, what the FDA has done in terms of evaluating the vaccines and make sure that we're comfortable moving ahead from that. First people to get vaccinated will be the people who are in the front lines connecting to you know the, the healthcare providers and things like that. So, yeah. so that's basically, there's a whole big, there are people all over the world working on strategies of who should get vaccinated first. The good news is a lot of these vaccines are talking about having 100 million plus within the next, uh, you know, not too far into the next, into 2021, maybe halfway through. So this is, my emphasis here is we really need a plan on how we're going to get everybody vaccinated because it is impacting so many people and so many businesses in so many ways that I just want to do everything I can to get this moving along because it's certainly a big impact on RTD. All right, that was a lot more than you needed to hear. So if anybody doesn't have any objections, I'm going to move ahead uh, with this and we can move on with our agenda as well. So Ron, you want to take it back over and pop the agenda up? I can do that. Okay. If you can stop sharing your screen, Rut. Oh, come on. I like that. Where did I, where's that sharing button again? Oh, it's, yeah, it's in that thing that I just dismissed. Right. Here we go. Hmm. Okay. You're. Looks like you got it. Perfect. All right. So um, let's move on to the state statutes summary, and and we have Jennifer here to uh, discuss some of these some of these topics. Uh, one of the things I wanted to start off by asking you to do, Jennifer, is is to get a copy of the full version of Title Two, Article Nine, uh, to Matthew or or Ron. I don't know how long that is, but we have the ability, I don't want to do that right now. We have the ability to put documents like that up in a place where everybody can get access to it. And these are excerpts, and, and I really appreciate Doug putting this, these excerpts together, but sometimes they're going to need to dig into it a little deeper. It would be nice if people don't have to go through the stakes process to get to these, which is learning another system practically than the one we already have. So, um, Jennifer, we'll get this to you guys, and we'd like to get it up on our information uh, website so anybody can see it. Okay. Uh, let's just start by saying why we care about this, Jennifer. Uh, there are some things that it might be possible that the legislature could act on when they reconvene. Uh, if we can identify some things in here that might be things that uh, – that we want to get relief from or we want to get a change in. And we don't know yet what those are. Elise has probably got better ideas on this than anybody in the group. But uh, uh, if, if you see particular things that we should want to know more about here, then I'm, I'm a little curious of what some of the history is. All the restrictions on taking this land and only using it for parking, for example. You know, if you look around, in fact, uh, if you look around in some of the other places, there are a lot of transit agencies that make a lot of money from the land associated with uh, with these location of stations. And certainly that is not the case here. In fact, we're restricted pretty severely from what we do. Is there a history there of maybe some lobbying that might have gone on when these laws um. were originally written? All of well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I am here strictly as a citizen and uh, someone who has a long history lobbying before the Colorado legislature. And our firm has represented RTD at the Capitol for over two decades. So, um, and Rhett, thank you for giving me a little chance to go down memory lane. Um, just going through my files, I realized I didn't have a lot of stuff um, in paper form because I was 
doing things on Palm Pilots back in the day. I mean, it really has been a long time. Um, but yes, there's, I guess what I would say in general is, you know, we are, RTD is a, a creature of the Colorado State Legislature and, and over the years inside the building, bills have been introduced, passed, amended, or killed that pertain to RTD. And I think Dr. Cog did a great job picking out um, a handful. I don't think it's at all, it, it, you know, my, my file is much bigger, um, but I think the ones that are highlighted here are ones that you guys are on the right track to look at. And there is a, there's definitely history to each one. And with regards to, um, I mean, the first one on there, I can just do a little highlight of, of all of them historically. And I guess what I would say as a citizen is it's a great place to look. Um, and there are reasons why these came mostly um, people who are elected live in the district and they had some personal pain point or experience with RTD and they wanted to change the landscape based on that. And I think our job as an advocate for the agency was to work with the elected officials who had the pain point, try to help them craft legislation that addressed their, their need, but at the same time try to preserve the district's ability to run a transit agency. So um, the whole conversation about competitive um, contracting and services, that's one statute, but there it goes back to the 80s where I think it was 1988 where the first fixed route private contracting threshold was set at 28%. Then over the years, it moved to 32. Then after a big political change in the 2000s, they moved it instead of a base of certain percentage to a cap. Um, and the definitions of how you define fixed route service or rubber tire service all impact how the district achieves those percentages. So I think um, that hasn't been touched in a long time. So it took me a while to go back and kind of remember the history, but it was, um, really started before me, the politics changed in the time that I'd represented the district. And so there was really a push in some ways to have more competition so we could get lower prices for some of our service. There was the politics of unionization versus non-unionization. Um, and so there is a long history there, but I think that is a, um, a statute that, you know, has a past, it hasn't been looked at a long time, but to your earlier point, Rhett, and to folks, I'm sure RTD and, and certainly our firm, we can help you get more detail on any of this as you want it. So you don't have to go to the Colorado General Assembly website and pull everything else up. Um, and we're certainly happy to share our fact sheets as we worked on these bills historically, who supported these bills and why, um, and kind of what the purpose was. Any of that, we're happy to share along the way if you want it. Um, fair box recovery ratio, so that's been in statute for a long time. I'm not sure how meaningful it really is because how you define fair box um, is it spelled out in there and it's operating and maintenance costs as well as I think you can, I think, and again, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not speaking as RTD. It's just a history of someone who's worked on some of these issues. Um, you can look at that. I know most recently that whole conversation came up at the legislature by Senator Tim Neville, who really wanted to understand how the 30% is there and what it means. Um, but I know I've, I've heard from Lynn and others that there's a lot of interest in TOD and the history on that. Um, you know, I think RTD can provide you much better detail on what we can and can't do. The statute hey, that hey, Lynn. allowed sorry, just, for, yeah, just Lynn, on, sorry, this is Ron. What, one yeah. quick question on the fare box recovery ratios before you move on. Um, so are you are you suggesting that that's not viewed as a particularly limiting factor or issue for RTD? That requirement? I'm, I'm just saying, I think the meaning of it is will be better understood if you can dig into what you are allowed to count towards 30%. Right. So I, I think you're allowed to account for 
federal dollars. So you can probably reach 30% pretty quickly if you include federal money. If you just pull out and have the fare box recovery be calculated by fares, I'm not sure we'd actually meet the 30%. So I think, again, this is a place where Lynn and, and folks from RTD can kind of walk you through legally how, how we meet, because we are complying with the 30% ratio, but I think it is, I doubt, I guess I would say it's worth understanding how you get to count, what you get to count to get to 30%. Yeah, and I, so, I think the issue, you know, you the, could, issue I'm getting, the issue I'm getting at is, you know, if it's not sort of having a particular negative impact on RTD because of the way it is, then it's probably not worth kind of spending a lot of a lot of uh, time on and political capital pursuing a change to that statute if it's not actually impacting RTD's finances one way or the other. Could I jump in and I would say agree. that there, there is a several different reasons to be looking at the statutes. One is ability to generate revenues, and that's certainly a leading thing. Uh, another thing is, though, to um, improve ridership, and a lot of cutting-edge transit agencies have been lowering fares in order to increase ridership, and that that is in the opposite direction of raising revenues, but it's about ridership, and if this is limiting R2D's ability to be flexible, and I say that, you know, from a jurisdiction where we've made transit free, at, say, up in Longmont, um, to and drastic, dramatically increased ridership, largely from low-income riders who are transit reliant. That might be something that RTD wants the flexibility to look at. So, let me let me uh, back up Elise on some of that stuff as well. The the issue that we're concerned with here is that the prime function of RTD is moving people, and right now we are so far below where we've ever been in terms of moving people in spite of huge investments over the past few years. So I think what we're looking for here, potentially, and we certainly have to look at the economics of it pretty hard too, but isn't RTD a much more valuable asset? And aren't we getting a better return on that asset if we can move twice as many people at least, and maybe twice as many people as we moved in 2019? By some, by looking at different ways that we can incentivize, and you know the the extreme end of that is free fares, uh, but there may be a lot of other room in between, and we're a little concerned about restrictions that are related to this thirty percent level. And, and I would just add, it's a little bit. We we put all of the statute review in the finance committee because a lot of it directly was directly related to revenues. But, you know, that is a provision that could be looked at in the operations committee. But for sort of efficiencies, we threw it here and and Rut, you can decide to throw it back if you want. Um, but just I think it's important in the statute review to remember that we're looking at a couple of different things, certainly revenue generation. But the other is it, it is the ridership. And and I'll, Rebecca, and, or Lynn, you could go, and then Rebecca. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see Rebecca. Um, you know, just talking to Jennifer this morning, and we talked some with Bruce Abel, and uh, um, I think uh, Jennifer is a wealth of knowledge and, and can answer a lot of questions, but it really made me realize that what we probably need to do is get with staff and the board and give the accountability committee a little more very specific you know, this would help for these reasons. You can disagree or want to, you know, go further, but I think that would be a good start. For instance, on the TOD, um, you know, we we are allowed to partner, RTD is allowed to partner with developers and, um, you know, RTD is, is about moving people. So I don't think that there's a desire in the agency to start doing the developing, but um, are there changes that would help? Um, I think we I think that the general view is that it's pretty, um, that we're able to, that RTD is able to do a fair amount with the statute the way it is. So I think Jennifer can be really helpful today, but it made me realize that, that getting you some specifics about what the statutes do and, and don't help with them, whether they're... Um, a barrier. Whether they're, what's that? Whether they're a barrier or not. Right, and whether you know whether they're helpful and other changes would be helpful enough to to go through the legislative process, I think is is a piece. So we, I will talk to people about coming back with something like that. 
Great. Thanks, Liv. Rebecca? Yeah, it was generally what I was going to say, you know, for that 30% in particular, I'd love to know how much of that could be met with federal revenue, how much depends on fares, and really understand better if that's a restriction and worth the, the effort of, of going through the legislative process, or it's really not. So I totally agree with Lynn. That'd be great to get some input from the staff. Yep. And, you know, we don't want to spend a lot of, of uh, waste a lot of brain power and effort on, on fixing something if it really isn't broken in some way. But we want to understand whether there are things we can do that really are, are significantly beneficial to the people that we serve. Okay. I, I agree. And the only thing I would add, Rhett, like parking is a really good example. That came because somebody who was an elected official didn't like the idea that we as a board had had a conversation about how do we manage our parking assets and could we charge for parking? So that conversation triggered um, a legislator to say, I don't want anybody to charge for parking. So they wanted to ban RTD from charging for parking and the compromises the current statute but this was done in like 06 so it's not going to save RTD millions of dollars or build a lot of light rail if we just change the parking thing but whether or not it's the right mix could be could you guys could discuss I would say and I think the history of it was parking is an investment and it's an asset that the agency owns they should be able to manage that and parking or paid parking for some of it was a way to direct and move people incentivize people to park in different places to use the asset better um, and i think the staff and the board had a better idea personally of how to manage parking and that asset. But the legislature, because one legislator who was very well placed, didn't like the idea of paid parking, we got this statute in place. And it has some flexibility for RTD and we've been working with it, I think, without any problems. But to your point, and Lynn's, I think there's a, the district could go through these and um, see if there's any that need to be changed that could be more empowering to them for various reasons and or give you the historical background. But all of them, I know you will not be shocked, all of these bills that impact RTD, you know, were proposed by people who are elected and again, had political pain points. So the balance is how the legislation got crafted. And I think where we've tried to be over the years is they're elected folks to the board who are accountable to their constituents and they probably have the tools with knowledge from you know qualified staff to make those best decisions. But legislature in, intervenes regularly, whether it's contracting, TOD, parking, fare box. You know, we had to do a bunch of legislation and ask proactively on behalf of the district for legislation because we were the first and only P3 project in the country. We had to change some of our statutes on bonding, um, you know, interest swaps, et cetera, really technical things that our bond council went to the board to say, we need to change these statutes to allow us to compete for this P3 project. So right. it's all based in politics. And I think, the, but Dr. Cog did a great job pulling the ones that I would have naturally pulled as have some financial impact to the district, not overwhelmingly, but there might be reasons why you want to eliminate them, modify them, et cetera. Okay, great. All right, well, let's, let's keep moving. Uh, Elise, Can, you got I quick. just want to say, I think parking is one of the ripest places for investigation. Obviously, people, nobody wants to pay for parking. On the other hand, that's perhaps one of the biggest subsidies in the system. Parking uh, parking space is thirty to forty thousand dollars, perhaps with initial construction, and then RTD gives it away for free, and yeah. that benefits people who have cars. So you know you could look at changing the finances so that you make fares fifty cents and you charge for parking. So anybody that bikes or walks and gets to the RTD system is incentivized to ride it and you recoup some of those costs in parking. There's a lot of different ways we could look at this. And that's the beauty of this committee is, while some of us are elected officials, we are independent and we can say things and recommend things that might not be politically popular, but might be the right thing to do from policy and revenue stand. So I would suggest that parking is a really interesting place for us to, to look at freeing up 
RTD and looking at um, ways we might um, do things differently. And so. the other piece of that too is how many of those cars are single occupancy vehicles that are parked there? Huge numbers of them. Chu wrote a great book about, about the things that are involved in parking. And in fact, uh, as we move down in, in our agenda, I've got a couple of slides that are related to the issue of parking. And there are things we can do there to use that asset. Uh, and, and some of it doesn't necessarily just involve uh, uh, charging for parking. Be, and it, it's also maybe an opportunity to incentivize electrification too. There's a, electric vehicles get a, yep. a different rate for parking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's keep there's moving. Of, We've got a lot of yep, to There's a the cost yeah. to being able to see because the way it's written is you can charge people who are out of district, but there's administrative costs to having yeah. the technology to and who's in and who's out. So there could be cost savings there as well. And I would I agree that parking would be a great place to look at. Yeah. Yeah, there, I find that there are probably a lot of areas where we spend more money on enforcement than we get benefit. So you have to really look at, is there a way to do this better? And that's, as Elise said, we have that freedom. <laughs> could we, uh, excuse me, could we get some kind of report on how much parking might possibly be uh, charged for? How many spaces are we talking about? Uh, you know, if you, ever, if you ever look at a map of the parking right lots, there is a huge investment that we've made over the years in parking. And it's sort of rolled into the cost of light rail and things like that. I don't know. Uh, Heather, are you on? Can you give us an idea of, of whether we could find out how much we have spent in the district building parking over the years? So yes, this is Heather. Can you hear me? Yes. So uh, yeah, in fact, we've done uh, quite a few presentations to the board over the last several years regarding parking, how much is available, uh, what, what various um, costs are that we currently pay to our third party vendor, uh, who maintains, or not maintains, but main, well, collects the, the funding and, and does that now. So yeah, I think, um, and uh, planning um, has recently done a lot of work on that last year. So um, I think we have a lot of materials that we can share with you on the parking issue. Terrific, Matthew, could we get those on our uh, information website also? I'll make the request. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Heather seems like she's on top of that. Okay, um, I think Jennifer, that, okay, Lynn? I'm sorry, I think Bill Saroy had something to add there, there too, he's on. Um, okay. And then back to Jennifer. This, this, have, yeah, this is, the, we, we have a, we, we did do a, a very extensive report a couple of years ago on parking pricing and, you know, what the potential is for revenue and the pricing points and all that stuff. So that's something that we can bring back to the committee. It might have even, I'm not sure if it was uploaded as some of the documents that were provided for the committee up front, but if not, we can certainly upload it and or do a presentation on it. Terrific. Thank you, Bill. Okay, Jennifer, what do we got left? left? The forms of borrowing, I don't know if we're gonna wind up diving into that right now, but, um, are, are there, of the ones that are left here, you want to comment on any of that? I would, the only thing I would add is, and um, I don't think it needs to be done. I don't have any on what's here. I think one of the other more substantial pieces of legislation that ran in the last, you know, 10 years was the unification of our sales tax district with the states, because over the years, people introduced bills that pass it, you know, impacted how the state collects and who the state collects taxes from and ours were not aligned and so randomly we did collect taxes on some things the state didn't but we didn't on things like pop or candy and so when we did some unification of that it it ended up being a windfall to this to the extent to the scfd and rtd to about about $300 million because over time as the legislature passed legislation, sometimes we'd be included, sometimes we wouldn't. So, you know, I'm not proposing that there's legislation to 
on that front, but it just gives you a flavor of there is a long history because we've grown as an agency. Um, and they're probably, I commend you for looking at this and, and commend Lynn and folks at the district to taking it to a deeper level to see what might be there over time that could be worth um, freeing up so there's more flexibility for the board to, to do the job that they need to do, which is increase ridership and, um, you know, deliver people to and from folk places on time and in a cost effective way. So I have nothing else to add, but thank you for your work. And I'm really glad you guys are all doing this. And I, I can say from Brandyberry McKenna, we are anxious to partner with you in any way we can um, and happy to, you know, continue to work with Lynn and the board and the staff of, of getting you the information you might need. Jennifer, if you would, could you think a little more about that issue of, of missed revenues? Are there things out there that we're that small changes or capturing those revenues earlier or whatever else could have some positive fiscal impacts? We're certainly looking for revenue too. You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those, that, that those, just came to mind because we did run that a few years ago and it did, it really was, and it had to be drafted correctly. Um, you know, there was an argument by some in the legislature that that was a, a run around Tabor because it was increasing revenue. I think we were successful in putting that together correctly because in some ways it reduced revenue, in some ways it raised revenue, but the business community supported the effort because having it uniform was easier for them as the business community to collect. They didn't have to realize, well, if I'm in Douglas County, I'm in the SCFD district and pay it here, but I'm not in the RTD district, but I'm in the state. It was very hard for vendors. So um, I don't have any proposals for that, but I think Lynn and Heather and the board could certainly take this list and a list of other statutes that over the years have been passed and do a review and say, you know, to Elise's point, what's even if it's politically difficult, parking, you know, because there'll be people that say, if you free up RTD to charge for parking, somebody in the building will say, I don't want them to charge. But so there's difficult politics, but the policy might be the right way because it will increase ridership. You could, you know, reward people who don't drive in single occupancy. So I think there's a lot of conversations that any of these statutes, we can give you the historic background, but you all helping the district and doing your work can i think give cover to a bigger conversation of well people might not like parking but we should be able to do the district should be able to do that because they're missing opportunities and it can incentivize ridership etc cetera, etc cetera. so i don't have any personally but I, I i'm here to say please keep doing this there's a huge opportunity i think to work together to accomplish the goal that you know I think we're all we've all been engaged in this in some way or the other because we care about the district and want it to succeed. Well, just one one comment, uh, just throwing out a, a random idea at least. One of the things we could do without dealing with charging for parking at all is reserve spaces, and we could take close-in spaces and say these are for non-single occupancy vehicle. If you're bringing someone with you to to ride, then you would be able to park in those. I think I think so you're right. Is, Rod. I think you could take any number of if we uh, separate ourselves from the statutes a minute and just said, gee, how could we use the, the asset of parking in order to meet our goals for RTD around ridership, equity, air quality and climate, um, ridership in general? We could come up with all sorts of ideas. If you drive an electric vehicle, if you're in a carpool, if you, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and so not only would this committee, I hope, want to suggest to the legislature, free up um, the issue of parking for RTD, we also would want to tell RTD and RTD, you should do these things in order to meet those goals. So I think there's probably two parts to this investigation. And yeah. I, I think probably the next step would be to ask RTD, you know, board and staff to, to put together their brief sort of um, list of things that they they see as statutory barriers. And then I would also invite our rich um, body of stakeholders, subject matter experts to also weigh in on that because there may be things that, um, that other uh, interests see as barriers for some of the goals that they would like RTD to achieve. 
and and then move on from there. Uh, okay, uh, I'll, Lynn, can you uh, carry the ball on that one? I can. I will go back and uh, I think there are quite a few people listening who have uh, have a lot of information and. Um, we can get something put together. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks. So uh, that's a great segue into talking about uh, the the issues that we want to really focus on. So let's go ahead and move down to yeah. the yeah. last item on the agenda, which is a really big item. And uh, attachment C, not governance. Keep going. Down to Somebody's the trying to speak, hey. Brett, and I can't tell who. It's uh, it's Dan. Oh. Hey, could somebody give me an explanation about the levying of taxes provision and how that works? Is that requiring an election to pay for annual deficits of, uh, for property taxes? How, how does that work? Okay, uh, bounce back up to the issues. There, there is a point, and I noticed this too, where you actually could go and say, all right, we we had a budget problem and therefore we could levy a tax, a mill levy type uh, property tax. So this is Heather, do you want me to address yeah, that real quick? Heather, would you jump in? Yeah, so this provision is an, a pretty old provision in our statute that allows in the time of um, any type of deficit or actually a situation like we have now that we could levy property taxes. Um, However, this was written prior to Tabor. So Tabor takes precedent in that we would need to go to a vote of the people to levy that um, particular piece of it. But it is a it is currently in our legislation that allows for that. Um, we are our Tabor calculation is based on property taxes, um, not the state's um, calculation. So um, that is actually one. Thing I would add to the list is that's a weird calculation that we have to use property taxes even though we don't levy property taxes. So, um, but that's what this is one's all about is um, if there's a situation where we have a deficit um, in operations and maintenance, we could go back to the voters and um, ask for a property tax. Could, could you write something about that, uh, particularly that weird, weird part? And, and, you know, just read, you know, less than a page and pass it on to the committee members. Sure, no problem. Because it sounds like that's something that might be worth. Uh, it's a very at. interesting provision that most people don't know about. Yeah, I didn't know that that would be impacted by Tabor if Tabor came after that. Yeah, you, it can't, this was uh, done before Tabor, and so Tabor is a constitutional, so it will take priority over this. So My means we have to go this is not something we're going to get any money out of, but it would, it would be nice to understand it a little better, just in case. Sure. You Thank you. I'd hate to go to the voters for a vote on anything RTD related right now. So um, let's go ahead and go down to the finance subcommittee part. And um, This is this is a bit I must say a bit complicated to do in this form, um, you know. But I, I really was looking through this, and even the item one, boy, there's a lot of stuff in item one here, and uh, I guess I'm being uh, I. I've read through this and I've got a whole page full of red marks and notes and things, but uh, I, I, I just don't know exactly how to go through these. Um, our, our goal here is to say, what are the things we really want to focus on and where are the places where we can make a difference? And so if you look at one, if you'll forgive me for reading, it says review and make recommended changes to RTD to achieve more sustainable financial model, including review of investment policies, guiding principles, debt, regional, and this issue of sub-regional funding allocation, and statutes that limit opportunities for revenue generation, cost savings, and increased ridership, including provisions that. So th that last part there, I think we talked about a fair amount of the statutes related stuff already. Uh, and we have a, some plan to, to dive into that a little deeper 
when we get more information. Uh, the the first part is basically our, you know, the the real motivation, and that's review and make recommend changes to to achieve a more sustainable financial model. Everything else, in a lot of ways, for our committee flows from that. And uh, if we look at review of investment policies, guiding principles, uh, one of the things I mentioned before is I would really like to understand the total cost of, uh, of our build out of fast tracks, including the debt. If you buy a house after 20 years, 30 years when you pay your mortgage off, the cost of that house wasn't what you thought you were buying when you signed the brokerage agreements. It's that plus all of the interest that you paid on it. So I would like a better estimate of what we have invested in uh, in light rail and in uh, in fast tracks, in fast tracks, but also the light rail before fast tracks. What do we have there that that is? If I want to look at return on investment on an asset, I need to know what that asset costs. And so, uh, Heather, is that possible? Can you put that together without necessarily having to break it down by line? Although that would sure be a lot better. So I can put it together in total for fast tracks because that's how we account for interest expenses as a program for fast tracks. But I cannot break it down by line because we don't allocate that interest expense against individual lines. Okay, what about pre-fast tracks, the initial build out of light rail? Um, I need to check on that because that information we'll have to dig for. It's not as readily available as the fast tracks information. Um, so let me see what I can do on that. Okay, that part's really relevant if we want to look at the whole system. And, and I also, right. I don't understand why we can't um, do at least a rough allocation of debt. That makes no sense to me. I mean, there's specific, I mean, we know the costs of of each line and we know, you know, when we've borrowed money for it, when we've gotten federal dollars in for it. It just doesn't make sense to me that we can't apportion that out. And I, I bring this up because we've had this discussion earlier. If you want to try to figure out, you know, as, you know, different parts of the region receive their fair share, if you can't allocate the debt, you can't answer that question. Um, so, and I don't know if that's something, our, you know, we have to, to send to the consultant to be able to figure that out. But to date, we've not been able to get those numbers from RTD. And so it's it's a little bit um, difficult to, to be able to answer that question then. So I can tell you what we received federal money for and which project it was used for, but from an, um, debt, we issue it as at the program level. So at the fast tracks program level, it's not specifically issued by project. So every project, if you wanted to allocate it, every project would just get a proportional share of it. Um, and I've mentioned that numerous times before. So um that's just how the program i wasn't here when it was set up that way that's the way it was always been done and that's and the last debt was issued um right after i came so um but i can um provide uh the overall data for everyone this is this is a hard issue i think we probably need to go back to it and and dig through more of this right now but I appreciate Elise's pain point on this. And it, it really is true that, you know, in the case particularly of, of those Northwest communities, they really need to know how much has gone where and, and what, how it has benefit, benefited on a, what we call a sub-regional funding allocation. So I'm sure this is not a done issue. So any thoughts that you can have along the way on that, Heather, so we can understand better the, the problems that this creates for you? Appreciate that too. Sure, okay. no problem. Thanks. Um, regional sub-regional funding allocation is, is part of that question and how that gets uh, how that gets handled. And uh, and that's, I think, part of uh, what Elise's concern is, but it's not only a concern for the Northwest. You know, we've got the South Line that's still got to be built out. There's stuff in the North Line that we need to 
we need to look at too. The, the, one of the things we need to understand is how much do we still have to build out within all of the uh, rail system that, uh, that, that we have. And so one of the things that would, would be very useful to get, and I'll bet there's a study out on this already, how much is left to do and what are the costs associated with that? What are the estimates for all those parts? So, Rut, this is this Rut, This is Ron. We we uh -huh. haven't lost, we we haven't lost track of that conversation and request from the finance committee. I think uh, not the last meeting, the meeting before. So we're working up sort of how to how to compile the information request, what information RTD actually has, and what we can get. RTD did do last year, did complete last year, an unfinished uh corridors report unfinished fast tracks report so that 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 information is available but um we're working through sort of in terms of that previous finance subcommittee conversation sort of how we structure the request get what information we can and then and then kind of figure out where the gaps in information are and where we might want to do some additional investigation terrific good rut could i just make a point about the regional sub-regional Sure. That that was, I think, more related to if the governance subcommittee was looking at it, sort of an alternative governance structure that had sort of partnerships with local um, governments where, you know, RTD is focusing on the regional system, the locals are focusing on their local transit system, and there's a sharing of funds, um, that there's an opportunity potentially to, ha to have a local match and to leverage um, RTD funds locally. So there's a revenue um, component that could um, come forth as you build that trust and partnership with local communities. So that's why it was brought, it included in the finance subcommittee is um, there's some, uh, some a financial implication, a positive one potentially on that front. So that's what that um, regional sub-regional comment uh, in number one was really related to. And I think you also said, uh, Elise, that there was a model that was out there already that I believe was Dr. Cog uses to look at regional, sub-regional. Um, that the current TIP process um, that process. was used in the last go around has a regional, sub-regional, um, two separate uh, buckets of money. And the sub-regional was um, forums were at the county level, the county's meeting with all the municipal, municipalities to make recommendations on how um, the sub-regional allocation would be spent. It was, they had to meet certain metrics uh, related to um, Metro Vision, and then the full Dr. Cog board had to vote on the recommendations from each sub-region. And then there was a separate, separate regional allocation for larger, bigger, regionally um, relevant projects. So that it was suggested that maybe something like that could be a model um, uh, to look at in a regional sub-regional context. I, I was in the background on the governance uh, subcommittee meeting uh, on Monday and, uh, and heard some of those discussions, but I have to tell you, it was like right over the top of my head. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I always, am concerned about introducing complexities uh, but at the same time there's a real issue about you know what who's getting their fair share of what and how it's allocated so i think this is an issue we're gonna wind up having to look at more but it, i think a lot of that may wind up filtering through this, the government's subcommittee what are your thoughts elise Lynn. Well, I, I, th I think with a lot of this stuff, there's a shared piece of it, but because the finance, the financial, you know, how the money is divvied up um, and decided and whether or not it could be matched, whether or not it can leverage other funds, that is in the wheelhouse of the finance committee. So there's probably needs to, to be, as the governance committee sort of goes down that path and looks at options, um, some communication with the finance committee about, gee, how would that... Um, positively land on on the uh, finance committee's ledger if you will mm -hmm. so Lynn, did you have a comment you wanted to make no I, I guess i'm just thinking that i need to understand the the sub regions better and and uh, um, get that back to others at rtd so 
we can we can help look at that and, and raise issues and, and things to be you know examined in the process. I will so, right, say maybe while the individuals on the RTD accountability committee may not be super familiar with the the um, TIP regional sub-regional process, every one of the communities in Dr. Cog participated in it. So at least from an institutional standpoint, it is it is familiar. So for whatever that's worth. And at least were you chair Dr. Cog at one time or something like that? Uh, I chaired in 2016. Okay. Thought so. Well, Rhett, maybe maybe Ron or Doug could just give this committee a 10, 15 minute overview on the regional sub regional process just to bring all our knowledge up to the same. Yeah. Maybe we could schedule that for our next uh, our next meeting. We Ron, can do that. Can you and Matthew do that, please. We can. We can. Great. Thank you. So um, there's there's a lot of the, a number of the things that are under item one. We we've already talked about some, but we haven't really nailed down. For example, all the parking issues and and uh, probably one of the biggest one are the TOD sites. So transit oriented development and and how it generates riders and uh, for RTD, but also how ridership and RTD benefits TODs. I mean, it is it is a, definitely a symbiotic relationship there. And so, you know, it, it's interesting because if you look at, uh, at some parts of the world, um, the there are revenue sources associated with those relationships uh, that can be kind of uh, uh, complicated, uh, but can also be very beneficial for uh, transit and funding of transit. Um, Hong Kong, for example, I was giving a talk out there on uh, some stuff on autonomous vehicles and and they, their Hong Kong says, I was fascinated looking at it. It is really profitable their transit system. A lot of the rest of the world doesn't wind up with real heavy subsidies all the time in uh, in their transit. And some of that comes from, you know, if, if, if you're if you're in the train stations in, in London or places like that, there's all kinds of commercial activity that's going on uh, within those. And it's true in Germany and it's true in Austria. And, you know, it's true in the Netherlands. And I don't see where RTD is getting any kind of financial benefit because for one thing, we're not allowed to have any kind of commercial activities that competes with any other business in that in that general area that's near the stations. That's a really odd thing to me that we were constrained in that way. But we probably won't solve that today. But um, but I think this is an important point about looking at the TOD sites and how that relates to, to everything else that we do. Um, on two, um, and we're, we're just not gonna finish this today. It's pretty clear. But let's get through as much as we can. Uh, review fast track spending and make recommendations on how to achieve equitable resolution for the unfinished fast tracks corridors. This will include answering the following questions. Well, we have uh, three, four minutes. We can probably nail this whole thing right now, can't we? <laughs> it's this is a, a core issue for the sustainability of RTD. These things, there has to be some sort of understanding of how a resolution will be reached. Whether it's reached any time in the near term is another question. But it's it is a tough nut to crack, obviously. But the, you know, where does the money come from right now? We have large debt burdens on what we've already built out, and uh, I, I I hope I have. A, a magic wand that I just haven't been issued yet to solve some of these problems because it's hard. But it's I, I definitely want to say this is something we just can't set over on the side and say, oh, this is too hard. We can't we can't talk about it. It's it's an area where we really need some out of the box thinking of how we might be able to address some of these issues. So make recommendations on how to improve financial transparency and build back public trust and demonstrate RTD accountability to the voters and policymakers. This public trust issue is a big deal. 
And it's also a big deal because it involves the legislature. And the legislature's willingness to make some changes and things like that, if you look at the whole legislature, uh, we don't have a lot of huge fans over there right now. And so this is one of the things that excites me about the idea of engaging on solving this COVID-19 vaccination issue. It's a real good opportunity to build some great PR and public trust for, for RTD. But uh, but it is it is a tough challenge. I don't want to in any way minimize it. So this other thing is a public online dashboard. And I know this is something CDOT has done. They built a, a really nice system for that. I understand it cost you about $200,000 to acquire the rights to use that, Rebecca. Is that about right? Oh boy, I don't know. I can't recall. Like that's, I can get you that number. You're you're probably in the ballpark, yeah. Yeah. So we don't necessarily want to pick up a two hundred thousand dollar extra expense in doing it, but it really is important that we have that kind of transparency. And so, Lynn, I know you're going to look into this. We yeah, uh, I am, but I can also say that uh, I know that um, a couple of board members and Heather or some of her team have looked at various dashboards. We um, uh, passed a resolution recently where we put a, a new system. We already had had our checkbook uh, online, but this is a, is a more uh, user-friendly way to get to it. But um, I think some of this may have dropped off a little bit in recent weeks with uh, everything else we're dealing with. But I know that they've looked at the CDOT dashboard, they've looked at a couple of others, and I think maybe one that the IT department was uh, had partially built. Um, heck, correct me if I'm wrong, Heather. Maybe not. So, Sorry, so, um, I'm find the mic. <laughs> so um, I, so I, I, I would say on this that, you know, we're the RTD Accountability Committee and we're here to help. Good. So, you know, if, if there are places in this that we can engage, especially in in the case of Rebecca, who is connected into CDOT, be useful to understand CDOT's process of how they come up with the decision to use that product. And if it was made five years ago, then it probably isn't relevant today, but it might be. Understanding what they did there, I think, is important. And then just to wrap up, uh, understanding partnership opportunities with local governments, uh, that's, a, that's an area, especially on that last mile, first mile, last mile issue that I think has a lot of value, but it could go beyond that in terms of how we plug into other uh, groups like what they're doing in Fort Collins. So uh, we've talked about these things. We haven't really under done a good prioritization of what we're going to attack first. Let me do some thinking on that and get something uh, back out to everyone. And please provide me with your thoughts and ideas on that on priorities. And uh, with that, I think I'll, I will ask for a motion to adjourn, unless anybody has any further comments before we do. Okay. No, thanks, Fred. Let's adjourn. adjourn. Thanks so much, thanks, everybody. Fred. Good discussions.